I've actually got uh, two, two parts to this talk. Um, part one, I'm going to talk about a paper that was published uh, a few years ago. And, um, you know, we, we've seen lots of people talking about I put volcanic aerosols and my mock increased. I think it'd be interesting just to dig down in one model and look at the actual mechanism, what actually happens in this system, and how can we understand why the AMOC speeds up. And in the second part, um, we've done with our latest decayed prediction system, done some of these component C3 experiments, and I'll give you some very preliminary results from that. So yeah, um, well, Alan gave a great introduction to this, so I don't need to say much here, but major vol volcanic interruptions tend to increase the AMOC. Um, two major mechanisms, you know, either increase the density at high latitudes by cooling, um, cooling the surface waters there, or by increasing the uh, salinity. But as we've talked about, the, the response could be state dependent. Um, there are models which go either way. I think we saw that in the last presentation as well. Um, so I thought, it might be interesting to look at a case study. So this is done with the, with the HADSIM-3 model, which is quite a few years old now from the Hadley Center. We're looking at uh, Krakatau, which went off in August 1883. Um, we've got a six-member ensemble which has all the forcings in, which I call all, and then a six-member ensemble with no volcanic aerosols, which is no Krakatoa or not. So right at the top here, you can see the difference in aerosol optical depth. So the, the um, full line is um, with, with the Krakatoa um, aerosols in it. So you can see it starts here in 1890. So here's when, when the uh, Krakatoa goes off. There's actually a few small ones as well since then that we, we took out as well. And then in, after 1900, we resume and both, both ensembles have, have the same volcanic for forcing again. Here are your global um, OLR anomalies. Obviously, without the volcanoes, not much change. With the volcanoes, you see quite a strong impact. Also, when you see in these plots that there are circles or open circles or filled circles, it means that the difference between the two runs is statistically significant. Um, so what I wanted to talk about then is this third line here where so the volcano goes off over here, and about 10 years later, we start seeing these differences in AMOC, which persist over about 10 years. And then when these aerosols come back in here, it seems like they join up. There might be some later effects as well. You see this trend here is much bigger than that trend, but I won't, I won't talk about that today. Um, the AMOC has an impact on the Atlantic heat transport, as you might expect with the increased heat transport. So even though the global ocean gets a lot colder when you put the volcano in, if you just look at the Atlantic Ocean, you get two responses. Initially, it cools, which we see down here in the, in the first few years after the eruption. But then as the AMOC and the heat transport increases, you actually see um, a bit of warming. Sorry? I'm trying to look at those filled circles. It doesn't seem there's only one there, yeah. But there are, you, you can look at um, maps as well, obviously, and see, see significant um, anomalies. So the reason this is averaged over 40 north to 55 north, so maybe I should have taken a smaller box to get more significant boxes. Anyway. So as, as I said, this mechanism is a salinification mechanism. Um, so within the, it's a few years after the eruption, this is years three and four, I think, after the eruption. Um, you've got contours here showing your salinity anomalies, this difference between all minus no Krakatoa, and um, full, full, full um, lines are positive anomalies, hatched lines are negative anomalies, and then this shows where you've got this hatching, you see um, this is, again, statistical significance. So you can see the You've got here up in the high Arctic, North Greenland, off Canada. Um, we're getting salinity anomalies already here. There's also in the Norwegian Sea. And uh, two, two years after that, 
this has been advected up and these get advected along and you start getting a big salinity anomaly along here and then two years again after this you can see all along Greenland we're seeing these big um, salinity anomalies. So where do these salinity anomalies come from? We think it's to do with a slowdown in the hydrological cycle. So this is total precipitation from 60 north to 90 north, so everywhere in the Arctic, because looking at the maps, you can't really see one particular location which receives less precipitation. It seems to be generally a general reduction in the Arctic of precipitation. You see this happens within, say, two years of the eruption, and it goes on for quite a long time. Um, I think there's a, another mechanism as well here, which is that Greenland in these simulations has a few cold summers. Those are June to August uh, summer temperatures. And colder temperatures would mean less um, melting. So there's less, less runoff from... So there's less... There's, to begin with, there's less precipitation and there's less runoff from that precipitation in summer as well. This is accumulated anomaly of Arctic runoff from Greenland. And you can see that um, eventually these two separate and you get to what the um, accumulated amount of runoff that the ocean receives becomes significantly different in the two ensembles. And here's the um, top 100 meter salinity off the East Greenland coast. We're now about um, eight or nine years after um, the eruption. I'll just skip forward here. So this is in this, in this box in the um, Greenland Sea. And we're looking here at vertical profiles in the box. And so, um, see that you, this area, this part of the ocean has the property that you have cold, fresh water that overlies um, warm, salty water. Um, so what these profiles are actually showing, you can see it in the density as well, is reduced stratification. As we're seeing a lot, lot of vertical mixing, and you're mixing up warmer temperatures. So even though it's cooling you know, globally, locally here, you get these warmer temperatures, which is a sign of this increased vertical mixing, and you get a signal in the salinity as well. So if we go back to this one, to, um, so we saw this salinity signal, and then you've got, we looked at the cross-section at the Denmark Straits, and we looked at the flow of the Denmark Straits, and sure enough, around 11 years after the eruption, we see starting to see differences here between how much flow of, there is of the Denmark Strait. And in this model, um, dense water flowing of Denmark Straits gives you straight away an increase in the AMOX. This one's the same one as you saw before. So the, this is just a map of, of the density anomalies. So about uh, 11 years or so a, after the eruption and uh, 13, 14 years later, and you can see the density anomalies have all gone down the western boundary. And this is the period when the AMOC is really increasing. So, to summarize, uh, how these timescales fit together in this mechanism is you have cooling of the tropics, that just takes a few months. Uh, the hydrological cycle then starts slowing down with a reduced evaporation. Um, after two years, you start seeing significant differences between the ensembles. This then leads to less precipitation in the Arctic at uh, four to eight years without having these increases in salinity which happen to converge in the Greenland Sea, which induces vertical mixing there. This model specifically makes a lot of its deep water in the Greenland Sea, and therefore this increased over straits overflow um, strengthens the AMOC, you know, more than 1.4 1, 1 sphere drops over you know, quite a long period. Because the density stratification that you showed, below 200 meters, there is no change in density. 
So if the Denmark State overflow, if there is going to be source water forming to the north mm. in the Nordic Sea region, that penetration has to be down to 600 meters to 800 meters. Sure, look, that, those are long-term averages. You'd have, I'm, I'm guessing the, the, water, the deep water is not, you know, not made over time scales a month, it's made over a shorter time scale, so that's probably why it disappears in those profiles. But if it disappears, then it's going to be mixing. So that's, I, well, anyway, I, I'd yeah, like to that's see the mixed layer depth, time series evolution of depth before concluding the last Okay, yeah. Um, so one of the points here is this 11 to 18 year time scale, which means that this is, that looking at the AMOC response in our decadal handcast is not really going to be a possibility. So some models have responses within five years, but, but they generally between five and 15 years to see a response in the AMOC, and it can go on for quite a long time. So in, in our uh, component C experiment, we may not be looking very much at AMOC. So we also did a stud study in the same model in Pinatubo to ask is, is the same thing happening again? You can see again, we have our aerosol optical depth, our lower anomalies, but on the AMOC, there's no difference. And the uh, Atlantic only cools, it never warms, obviously, since the AMOC doesn't increase. And now the chain in our mechanism where it all breaks is that these Arctic precipitation anomalies are not as large at the time of Pinatuba as they were at the time of Krakatau, and our runoff accumulated anomaly is just too small to have any major salinification. So it just shows you that mo moving forward 100 years may, might be the difference, or it could be the initial state or whatever. We haven't really managed to, to, to break this down and find out what the, the how, why this precipitation mechanism didn't happen. Yeah, and we also did another experiment when we actually put Krakatau into 1991 and the same result that you don't get the same mechanism. So it's not the aerosols, it's something to do with the climate system, maybe climate change, you know, climate change is, is in full swing. So. so let me move on to part two, uh, my early results. So this is with our latest um, decadal prediction system, which is slightly higher resolution and has a quarter degree ocean. Um, so I've looked at Pinatubo, which we've heard several times now, goes off in June 1991, also quite close to the equator. Using 10 member ensembles, there, these are initialized now with our best knowledge of the um, initial state, both in the atmosphere and in the ocean. And I've done four experiments. This, obviously, the, this is obviously the normal Hindcast experiment, starting in November 1990. And, um, but this was the same hindcast with the volcanic aerosols taken out. This is a November 2014, so our forecast for this year, um, but with Pinatubo aerosols added into it, and then just the forecast that we ran. And um, yeah, some of these runs only just finished, so it's a very early times. But, so we've seen this one already um, in Alan's talk. This northern hemisphere winter response looks like it, you know, it's fairly robust in observations. We have a good mechanism for which Alan went through. So, you know, it'd be interesting to see if it's in the models. So what I've done is I've taken the um, with volcano minus volcano, and I've combined both the 1990 and the 2014. So you get two 20 member ensembles and hoping we'll have a chance then to see the signal. But here's the mean sea level pressure. You know, it may project a little bit on the NEO, but that's by far not a canonical NEO. And it doesn't give you the right circulation to get warming. In fact, the first winter after the eruption here, we get colder temperatures. So what does it matter putting Pinatuba into 2014 instead of in, into the 1990 Heincast? And so this is the di rather than the common response, this is a difference in the response. And interestingly, the difference in the response here is our NEO. This is pretty much what our NEO looks like in the model. So it's 
So putting the volcanic eruption into 2014 gives you a much more NAO-like response. And of course, then you, when you've got circulation right, you get your high latitude warming. So this could be showing uh, the initial state dependence because the, and maybe there is a little, little bit of state dependence or because here we're just comparing two 10 member ensembles, this could all be noise as well. So as I said, preliminary results. Um, we we want to look into the mechanism that Alan's been talking about and actually see that happening in the model as well. Um, Alan also talked about responses in the ENSO region. There was an El Nino event after all the three major eruptions, which is in the Hanka set. In at least two of the cases, there were already El Ninos on the way when the um, eruption went off. And we've also seen that the responses vary from La Nina to El Nino to, to nothing. So what happens in this model? So actually, if I go back, this is the first DJF. We're not actually seeing anything in the common response or really any difference between the models. So not getting any El Ninos in, in the first year, at least in the average response. I'll show you, show you something else in a minute. So we looked in, I've looked also in the second DJF, which is what's on this slide. And here we start seeing actually, even though we didn't get the El Nino, looks like st something in the common response which looks a little bit La Nina-like. The precipitation anomalies are kind of correct in the East Pacific, this suppressed precipitation, but we're not really seeing the increased precipitation of the maritime continent you might expect. Looking at the difference in response now, um, it's a bit more La Nina-like. So again, putting your volcano into 2014, you're getting more of a La Nina-like response than in 1990. And the precipitations are suppressed here in the, in the east and increased in the west. So this, to me, looks more like a La Nina-type response. Um, but I thought it was interesting just to look at the Nino 3.4 index. So the red line here is with Pinatubo. It's the 20 member ensemble from both, uh, both with volcano experiments. And then blue is without Pinatuba, again, the 20 member ensemble. So it starts in November. This is the first DJF around the one here. And they look very similar still. And then you get, you get it's only by the kind of second, D, well, second autumn, second DJF, you start seeing this tropical cooling um, definitely making a difference. And perhaps, so these dashed lines are the um, one standard deviation of the ensemble. So you're seeing a slightly increased um, chance of El Nino if you don't have Pinatubo in. And maybe um, with Pinatubo, a larger chance of having a La Nina. And, um, yeah, you can see sometimes these ensemble, the distribution of ensembles change quite a lot. We're getting then in the year after that a much higher increase. Sorry, there's year two, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, much more chance of it ending, uh, less chance. Would you look at the year 3.4 compared to the rest of the ocean? Could this just be a global cooling? Yeah, sure, you can see this is a global cooling. It's, it's constantly there. Um, Yeah, that's why I was looking at precipitation in, in the other one. It's kind of my way of looking at that you have the, the precipitation pattern would give you the contrast. But also here you can see in year three with Pinatubo, much more chance of La Nina again, but not much change chance without Pinatubo. So it seems to be changing statistics of ENSO a little bit. So my conclusions um, very general at the moment. I, you know, I kind of directed this towards our component C3. There are only a few major volcanic, volcanic eruptions in our um, well-observed period, so the recent years. Models disagree on the strength and even the sign of some of the responses, and um, this also varies with the volcano. Um, I think, you know, 
that it probably has to do with the model's internal variability, meaning whether you're going to get a salinification mechanism or, or, a, or a cooling mechanism, depends on how your AMOC is driven. Um, so I think it would be really interesting to, with, with the analysis of the component C3, to also understand a little bit about the variability in the models and how that's driven. Um, yeah, as I said, you need long integrations to study the impact of AMOC, so either we'll have to extend the, the hindcasts, which are going to be part of component C3, or, um, yeah, not necessarily expect responses in the AMOC, and need large ensembles to study these coupled and atmospheric impacts, because uh, there is a lot of noise, particularly for this northern hemisphere response, but also in ENSO as well. Thank you. I mean, there is a lot of noise in these model predictions and so forth, and, but everyone seems to be pretty confident about how the system responds. Is that correct characterization, or is, there, is it really quite uncertain in the real world as well? And how do we make this comparison? Yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I think one of the big issues which Alan touched on already is that there's been El Nino's in all the volcanic eruptions, and it really doesn't help us with our observed time series. We have to go, there is some evidence if you, if you look at reconstructed climates, you know, paleo observations maybe for, that, that might be in the Nino response as well, but, um, so in that sense, I think that, that response is a little bit contaminated in the observations. Um, the Northern Hemisphere response is very noisy, um, might be a little more robust in my mind, but I think I'd, um, I, mean, I, I, like, I like the fact that it has a good mechanism for it as well. So I think it'd be interesting to see how far, you know, when we run these experiments that we can look, so what I didn't have time to do is do these um, zonal mean latitude plots where you can see how, you know, how the winds have changed, how the heating changes in the stratosphere. So the whole mechanism that Alan talked about, and even if we don't get the NEO response, how much of that mechanism do we get? I think that those would still be interesting questions to look at. So if you went back to that, your time series, the AS Nima 3.4 with and without the mm -hmm. So I guess this would be consistent with talking about the Nicola Mayer paper, this this be consistent with her result, right? That it looks like <coughs> volcanic eruption does give you a better chance of a La Nina-like response. Yeah. That seems to be biggest about the third year after the eruption. But not the El Nino the year after. Not the El Nino right after. Yeah, no, it's just definitely nothing in year one. That this, they're barely different, the ensembles. Yeah. I mean, the, typically the El Nino in HCM3 is, has the right statistics, but for completely the wrong balance of mechanism. This is Hadjim. This is Hadjim three. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> now I changed model so halfway so through just to confuse you. <laughs> right. Yeah, How, how's the El Nino in Hadjim three? Uh, I mean, the statistics are, are similar, but today they are Hadjim Hadjim three. But it's classical in models that you, you, know, you get the right statistics through uh, error compensation between, I don't know, overactive atmosphere and slug absorption or vice versa. You, you have compensating mechanisms. So it's really, it's really hard. The second thing is the robustness of the difference. We know if you make two simulations and want to compare in your statistics, you need 300 years. Um, so, no, I understand volcanic eruption is a big signal, but still, yeah. and, you know, join Alan's question, what's, what's the background you take? It's, it's a difficult, it's a difficult... Uh, yeah. I'm hoping to do some kind of probability analysis and just seeing if there's a difference in probabilities of getting La Nina or not. What might be more interesting is to maybe not look at the Nino but the mechanisms. Look sure. at the Birkner's feedback or the, the you know, thermocline yeah. feedback, those kind of... There you might see large changes that maybe cancel each other but can still give you a, a, good, a higher signal to noise information or issue. I agree. I, th I think it would be really interesting if people really focused on, on mechanisms and you know, understanding what's going on in the model. John? I was going to raise uh, Gary's point as well, and, and also to Eric's point, I think you might uh, 
look at the surface wind stress in the Gulf of Pacific, because according to the mayor of Seattle itself, that's really where you see the signal, and that ties to the mechanism. Yeah. So my hunch is that if you look at it, it's going to be very clear that the, that the trades are, are weakening after the after the eruption, mm -hmm. and then there's going to be a strengthening in there. Okay, yeah, and the sea surface height is another one as well. Sea surface height. It comes out clearly as well. Yeah, this is uh, one of the reasons why in Rome we, we propose an, 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 an experiment as a tier 2 or even tier 3 with a slab ocean just to look into the, the, the wind anomalies because, in, so David Batiste say, um, as an oceanographer, he's interested in the wind stress and in the coupled models, all the models have problems with the enzodynamics in some way. And so it's really tricky to, to figure out um, what's really the impact is, or if it's not a model bias. So it's better to, 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 to use the wind anomalies or the wind stress anomalies and then drive ocean models where you can trust in, in the first approximation to see what's really going on. Yeah, well, I agree that looking at the mechanism of what John was saying, the wind, I mean, it's, so Alan alluded to, but we're, we're doing simulation at the moment coordinated with the, uh, so SPAX and, and the IPSL, in looking at the impact of, of uh, volcanic eruption on in, in, in India. And uh, we're not really looking at the statistics, but more at what mechanism, and we do see that slowdown of the trade winds afterwards. And then, when, once you see a robust response to that, then the models are gonna take that and do whatever they like to do with those kind of signals for their answer. But I think this is not the interesting bit. The interesting bit is that you, you have a robust response on the mechanism to explain why you have the slowdown of the trade winds. So it's what happens in the atmosphere, not necessarily what happens in the couple. Yeah, it's really, it's really an atmosphere thing. That's really, that's really interesting part. So like both to happen, but you've got to start with the atmosphere. Yes. <laughs> okay. Also, well, these lines. The uh, role of ENSO. It, it's, we are, I think we are quite unfortunate with uh, the, the events that we have, as, as Alan said. So 82-83 is probably one of the ENSO events that current systems predict the worst by far. And, and seasonal focus systems are particularly bad, and they show that they are particularly bad at this. And 90, uh, the, the event in 1991-1993 was particularly long, really peculiar from that point of view. So somehow we, 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 ha we are confronted with the fact that we, it's not climate noise, it's just that those two ENSO ev events are particularly bad for, for the climate systems, that, the climate focus systems that we have now. 